Most people would say that CRT televisions are only capable of standard definition 480i video, not knowing that CRT televisions actually went full HD at some point in history. This is the LG 32FS 3D HD CRT TV. Hello, this is LangGuy64 and I'll be taking a look at this colossal LG 32FS 3D HD CRT television. Yes, this massive glass tube is actually capable of full HD video and it even has an HDMI input to boot, which is uh, rather uncommon to see on an HD CRT because they usually only offer component video for high definition uh, video. So yeah, there's a reason why the tube on this TV is a massive wide thing, because it's an HD TV, unless it's one of those really early ones that can only do ADTV tops. So yeah, um, before I talk more about this, uh, I would like to point out that why is this video stretched on this TV? You there, on the TV, and no, not on the TV, uh, you there, set the correct aspect ratio please. Uh, only stupid people stretch non-widescreen videos to widescreen. I'll give you a minute. Alright. Okay, now that's where I'm talking about. Yeah, this video is not widescreen because uh, I'll talk about it more at the end of this video. But anyway, um, I was lucky enough to stumble across one of these TVs at, in one of the uh, surplus stores that I regularly check from time to time for anything cool and I wanted to nab it as soon as possible because uh, I know that I will never uh, find a TV like this in my again in my lifetime. Uh, I paid quite a lot for this TV like an odd uh, 6,000 Philippine pesos and you which is around 100 roughly 120 US dollars and you'll probably call me stupid for paying that much for a massive uh, CRT television that most people are probably uh, rather throw away. Well, well, I'm stupid after all, and I think it's worth it uh, getting this TV. At least it has more resolution than those stupid oversized 1366 by 768 uh, uh, LCDs that uh, companies try to market as full HD capable when they clearly aren't. So yeah, and this is actually and this TV is great for like playing uh, fit, uh, no not. 6th gen, 6th and 7th gen games on. So, yeah. Um, to those new to this channel, considering I've garnered uh, quite a number of new subscribers uh, after I posted a PS Noob SDK video uh, a couple of months back, uh, thanks by the way, um, I basically do uh, videos of whatever I feel like doing a video of, really. Uh, usually tech related, but I don't stick to uh, one single subject matter at all times on this channel. Uh, I, in other words, I don't only I don't only specifically talk about PS1 uh, related things at all times or game consoles in general. I want to have a uh, variety in this channel. I don't really want to do videos of PS1 only. Uh, that's not that's not my thing at all. Uh, in fact, I plan to do videos of uh, one of my many uh, old computers. Uh, uh, in my possession, especially that one, especially uh, one particularly interesting one uh, that I'm most likely going to do a video of next after this. So yeah, uh, though it won't surprise me if people unsub simply because this is not PS1 related video. Oh well, it's their problem, not mine. I want to have fun. This is just a hobby thing. I don't plan to make YouTube uh, my career. And I much prefer just, uh, and I have a real job, so. Uh, I can't always work on videos at all times and uh, because while well, life gets in the way. Uh, and I much rather keeping it that way because I can basically do whatever the f I want in my videos. Uh, wait, excuse me. Uh, basically allows me to do whatever the fuck I want to do in these in my videos. And this is as it as I don't want to look like some pansy on the internet. So yeah, never mind. I don't. Re I'm not really interested in. Uh, making ad revenue in any of my videos whatsoever. I like to keep my videos ad free, so uh, to add to the enjoyment, I suppose, uh, because you don't have to deal with stupid ads. So, yeah, uh, enough rambling, and I'll get on with it.
The first thing you'll notice is that, well, the screen is quite massive for a CRT, and it's wide too. Hands down the largest CRT I've ever owned, and it measures around 32 inches diagonally. As you probably noticed in the intro, this TV came from the land of the morning come, or South Korea in case you don't get that. Japan and Korean surplus stores are still a thing over here to some degree, and I occasionally find some cool shit from time to time, usually at prices much lower than what they usually go for on eBay. I guess that makes retro collecting more fun in the Philippines since there's usually no demand for such old crap here. The design looks pretty typical for a TV from 2006. If it hadn't been painted with black by the store I got this from for some idiot reason, and it's something they've been doing on a lot of their TVs. Parts outside the immediate screen border are supposed to be silver like in this photo of the TV, and to make things a bit more irritating, they got some of the black paint onto the information sticker at the back and the RCA jacks. What a bunch of living penises! Unlike most CRTs of this size, especially those that came before this one, this one's actually quite slim as this was from the swan song years of CRTs when companies tried to extend the relevancy of the technology by trying to squeeze the tube as slim as possible, which is exactly what Samsung did for their slim fit TV line from around the same period as this TV. While the TV itself is slim, it does not help with the weight however, as it weighs around 70 kilos and was quite a pain in the back to get this to my mom's room, where it stays at the moment as I don't have any room for it in mine. You definitely don't want to lift this thing all by yourself. TV table options are also limited due to the weight of this thing, as ones that have a glass surface or are made of particle board, which is most of them these days thanks to the dominance of LCD TVs, are definitely a no-no so it sits on this repurposed center table made of iron tubing, the glass of which had long since shattered and some plywood for now. This TV's got a lot of inputs. You got the usual composite jacks, three inputs and one output. Two of the inputs is this video and one of them serves as a front input hidden behind the right speaker. Two component inputs, an analog RF input and a digital RF input, which I'll get into in a bit. A single HDMI port, which allows for PCs and recent console peasant systems to be plugged to this thing very easily as long as they can output 1080i or 720p. Yes, 1080i, not 1080p. Optical input and output jacks. And lastly, this serial port looking thing which is labeled as an upgrade port. I have no idea how it works and I don't want to plug a serial cable to it as I want to risk damaging this precious TV. It's probably for updating the firmware of this thing by a service technician and maybe to adjust internal service adjustments as well. While I can find some information about this TV on the internet, they're all in Korean since this TV was a Korean exclusive model and I cannot find a service manual of it. I think it's mostly down to this accursed language barrier that is preventing me from finding more details about this thing. Even if I did manage to find said manual, it'll all be in Korean and would be kind of difficult to understand even with Google Translate sometimes. What sort of features does this TV have to offer? Well, despite the model number referencing 3D, this does not have any 3D capabilities whatsoever and it's likely just a minor revision change. It's got a 5th generation chip, which refers to the 5th generation VSB QAM digital TV tuner that this TV packs. So this can actually pick up modern ATSC digital TV broadcasts out of the box, but it's useless here as we don't have any digital TV in this part of the country that I've heard that the Philippines will be using the ISDB standard once we switch over to all digital which is not going to be compatible with this TV. I guess there goes the possibility of this thing being future proof when analog over the TV finally goes away here. Yeah, we still have analog TV to this very day as of the making of this video. It's most likely the last country to still have it. Which is good as it this allows me to demonstrate analog TV tuning which nobody else on the internet can do unless they live in the Philippines as well. Here's a sample of what the movie dub in this part of the world would sound like, for some laughs I guess. It's got Dolby Digital, and oh no, sounds really shitty. Well I think that's what it means as it makes everything sound really shitty like it's coming from some very tinny sounding phonograph down a tube underwater. Is this what surround sound is supposed to sound like? 
cruise around my ass. Oh yeah, this sounds fucking shit! Also, take a look at what happens when I plug my laptop's charger while the audio cable is still connected to the TV. Yeah, I guess the charger shits out a lot of noise that it somehow affects the TV's ability to sync to component video properly. It's also got LG's XD engine, which does digital image processing to the incoming video signal to improve colors and sharpness. In most cases, the results look decent, but sometimes the sharpening adds halo-looking artifacts around image elements that don't play well with such effects, such as text in certain foreground and background colors. Yeah, this TV internally processes video digitally, making this a hybrid somewhat, which is probably the most unusual thing to hear to those unfamiliar of CRTs having such a thing. As with any TV purchased from Sorplus, it does not come with a remote other than a generic and limited one provided by the store. This Chung Hup Universal Remote does the job nicely enough, as all the controls I need are covered by this remote. The only real fault that this TV had was the picture originally looked very bright. So bright that the screen shows a dark grey hue on a black image, which I don't think is normal for a CRT. Hence why I actually cracked open the TV to adjust the picture dial on the flyback thinking that some idiot technician fucked with the setting, but it turns out this TV has actually not been opened before, based on bits of plastic film of the protective packaging left underneath the screws, so I ended up making the picture look too dark. I opened up the TV once more to revert the adjustment I made, and strangely, the picture looks just about right after reverting it. How odd. There are also some slight geometry issues on the far sides and at the very top of the screen, which are most apparent when playing 2D side-scrolling games. This seems to be inevitable with CRTs as they get older in my experience, though this may be remedied by readjusting the three pots on the deflector coil and probably the choker as well, though I do not plan to adjust this TV anytime soon, considering this thing is a massive lad and I don't have the space to work on such a thing for extended periods if I ever want to bring this TV back to spec. It's not too distracting for the most part, so it can wait, and I still have a monitor to restore someday that also has the same problem, albeit far more severe. Gotta love the sound of the degausser coil and the high voltage kicking in. Using this TV as well, I'd probably be called a weirdo for saying this, but it's absolutely fantastic especially when watching movies or playing games with plenty of dark colors or bright contrasting colors, which CRTs are, and still to this day, the best at image contrast that even the latest OLED panels still cannot match. OLEDs are great and all, but CRTs still rank highest at color contrast in my opinion. Obviously, this video doesn't represent how good of a picture a CRT can produce, so don't bother writing about it looking like shit to you through this video or you'll look like a fucking idiot. This applies to pretty much any display technology, not just CRTs really. The TV is capable of supporting 480p, 720p, and 1080i resolutions from component or HDMI sources and will only accept NTSC system signals. Which is good because PAL can go die in a sinkhole in this day and age and there's absolutely no right for it to exist in a world dominated by digital video and 60Hz displays. I've been getting real sick of being stuck at 50fps as of late thanks to this LX7 being a PAL system camera that somehow got into this NTSC country. I'm considering switching to this standard def only thing from the early 2000s just for those sweet 60 frames in my next video. The TV appears to be running the CRT at 1080i constantly, even in 480p and 720p modes. The interlaced jitter is not noticeable at 480p and only slightly visible at 720p but it becomes apparent when you bring up the menu. I suppose it was much cheaper to have the tube run at 1080i constantly as it would not require additional circuitry to drive the tube at different resolutions. At least the TV does not produce any 15kHz whine that standard definition CRTs make, which some find to be irritating apparently. TVs capable of high definition video have been around for a long time actually, long before I was even born, at least in Japan as they've developed their own entirely analog high definition video system called High Vision as early as 1991 and was capable of around 1050 visible lines at 60 frames per second 
which is fucking insane for early 90s technology, you may want to watch Tecmon's video about high vision and the high vision laser disc format if you want to learn more about it. There have also been HD TVs from as early as the early 2000s, such as this even bigger of a fucker projection TV from 2003, which can take 1080i video from component or DVI on some of them, and the PS2 and original Xbox were capable of outputting 1080i or 720p with component cables. I find this TV to be perfect for playing 6th and 7th generation games on, especially the GameCube and Wii, as 480p looks pretty great on this TV, despite being internally upscaled, technically. Since the TV has HDMI, there should be nothing stopping you from hooking up more modern systems to this TV, provided it still supports 1080i or 720p if 1080i is not available. Unfortunately, Trying to play 5th generation and older consoles on this TV do not work out so well, as the display rate on the TV would periodically drop to 30fps as the video digitizing hardware inside the TV does not appear to be aware of video signals that don't have an interlaced jitter signal, such as 240p video, which is what older consoles typically output at. It would display ok, but there's a bit of fuzz around pixels and I suspect these issues are due to the dis digitizer chip sending duplicate video fields to the rest of the video processing when it loses field synchronization due to the lack of an interlaced jitter signal. And no, using this video or component cables does not solve this problem. I've done a test with a PS1 running a test program I made that displays a 60fps animation in 320x240 mode but with an option to enable interlaced jitter. Turning on jitter fixes the display rate issues completely, and it also made pixels look a bit sharper interestingly enough, which proves that the TV's video digitizer depends on the jitter signal, which sucks as otherwise it would have been pretty great to play such older consoles directly on this TV without the need of an HDMI upscaler. In fact, I was originally going to make fun of expensive HDMI upscaler devices in this video if it wasn't for the non-interlaced video issues. 5th generation games that run in high resolution mode display flawlessly however, but there aren't that many games on the PS1 or N64 that run at that resolution. I remember seeing a similar frame juddering behavior with my stupid Avermedia M791 capture card a long time ago, but it wasn't as juddery as the LG 32FS 3D when I did captures with it for this video. It still frame judders but it's few and far between and doesn't sustain as long in my recent recordings with the card. I still don't recommend the M791 for capturing old game consoles, as the frame juddering is probably due to the lack of an interlaced jitter signal. I guess companies have since forgotten how to handle non-interlaced video signals properly, which doesn't surprise me, considering I've used various modern capture devices from DVRs to USB capture boxes, almost always having trouble with such signals. Stupid. Speaking of stupid, Linux has a kernel module for the CX23887 chip and is loaded when my M791 capture card is installed, but it doesn't appear to do jack shit from what I can tell and it doesn't appear to spawn anything on the dev directory to access the card. I guess the kernel module only works on certain CX23887 based cards, assuming it even does anything. Playing games that run in 480i mode might be a bit problematic on this as the TV's the interlace algorithm exhibits light ghosting on low contrast elements that move fast, and using component cables or turning off the XD engine does not make a difference. So progressive modes or using an external upscaler is most preferred. As with pretty much any old HD TV from the mid to late 2000s, there's a quirk on the TV screen known as overscan, where the outermost edge of the video frame is not visible, reducing the effective resolution of the TV which is quite common back then for some reason. If you've used the video editing package before, you might have seen guides near the edges of the video frame when compositing tiles. Those guides are used as a reference of the overscan area so you can easily determine where to place your element so it doesn't get clipped off by overscan. Pretty much all modern HD TVs don't have overscan anymore, so the practice of taking overscan into account is fading away these days. This explains why some games I've shown have HUD elements clipping off screen, though most video drivers and recent game consoles usually have options to compensate for overscan, and it's rare to find a recent game with built-in overscan adjustments. 
For some strange reason, some games such as Cuphead would refuse to take 1920x1080 as a valid resolution option when playing on a 1080i display, even though games just have to render a full 1920x1080 image as the video card takes care of interlacing it for the TV, though Cuphead won't really benefit much from 1920x1080 resolutions anyway, but it's still rather odd. It's most probably due to video drivers reporting interlaced resolutions as 30Hz for some idiot reason, even though the screen is still clearly running at 60Hz. Stupid half frame rate because interlaced logic. Whoever came up with that idea needs to be interlaced. The reason why I'm upset with things calling interlaced modes 30fps or 30Hz is because the screen is actually running at 60 hertz. It's just at half the resolution of what's actually specified. Uh, because otherwise this screen would be a flickering nightmare if we were actually running at 30 hertz. Uh, basically like uh, trying to play a 24 frame per second uh, film projector without uh, anti-flickering measures. So this is misleading and it's annoying to me because you end up with a bunch of people who do video transfers from tape to uh, digital video who end up recording at 30 FPS and, and, and the interlaced content from 60i to 30p when it's actually possible to convert 60i to 60p with uh, FFmpeg's Yadif filter and also Vegas' uh, uh, blend or interpolate feature uh, filter. I don't exactly remember but I remember Vegas would actually uh, the interlace in a way that it will look like 60 FPS in a progressive video. So yeah, this is misleading garbage and I absolutely hate anything on Wikipedia that calls NTSC 30 FPS and PAL 25 FPS. It's actually 60 FPS and, and 50 respectively. It's, uh, it's just that the actual resolution is 240 lines or, or 256 in the case of PS1 with NTSC and PAL or I think it was uh, 625 basically half the resolution of the interlace signal because NTSC is uh, because the original NTSC signal is 240 lines or 262 lines and the way how, how they double the resolution is by rapidly alternating between odd and even rows oh no uh, basically alternating between the odd and uh, no, the even rows of a high resolution image and then and alternating between and then going to the odd and it rapidly alternates between odd and even. That's why there's that interlaced jitter. Because what you're actually seeing on the screen is 262 lines, not 525. So yeah, misleading garbage spreading on the internet. What do you expect? I haven't really noticed any input lag on this thing, even with the XD engine turned on. It most certainly isn't as responsive as a fully analog CRT TV since this does digital video processing, so light guns are most certainly not going to work. But it is quite responsive. I think it's actually more responsive than this shitty old Devant TV. Last thing worth pointing out about this TV is it features a comprehensive looking channel list. The interface looks like it can display names of channels and information similar to those DVB satellite boxes. But it seems it only works with digital channels by the looks of it as I don't think you can name channels yourself for the analog pages. But since there's no compatible digital broadcasts here, I cannot demonstrate this list showing channel names. And this concludes the LG 32FS 3D HD CRT overview. At least everything worth talking about this TV. I'll leave you to that dork with a camera to wrap this video up. Man am I so tired working on this long winded video project. I hope this was all worth the effort. And there you have it. I guess that's uh, pretty much uh, all there is to say about uh, uh, the LG 32FS 3D HD CRT TV more or less and uh, in case you're wondering what the 3D echo surround option when I was demonstrating uh, the sounds really shitty uh, spatulizer option do sounded like well it's basically like sounds really shitty but only just the echo uh, part it doesn't have that tinny sound effect eh, still crap I don't see the whole point of spatulizers really all they do is well make sound really make sound sound really shitty and yeah, um, um, in case you've noticed that, if you've noticed that the TV uh, actually looks pretty dusty in some shots, and then you might be thinking, oh, I'm not actually using the TV very often. No, I actually use it from time to time. In fact, my mom uses it pretty much every day whenever she watches TV in her room. 
Um, and well, the TV is simply just a literal dust magnet uh, because, well, it's a CRT TV and it needs to generate high voltage to drive the CRT and generating high voltage tends to generate a lot of static electricity which tends to attract quite a lot of dust. So yeah, and also the TV uh, being placed near the window doesn't help matters much. So the TV actually gets more dusty the more you use it. So you know, that's just the way how CRTs work. Uh, they get dusty when you keep using them really. Um, also, um, uh, what's that thing? Um, oh yeah, um, uh, buying this TV uh, as soon as I saw it in store was really a good idea because well, um, uh, when I came back to the store where I got the TV from uh, a couple of months later, um, those TVs were gone completely. Uh, they said it was withdrawn because no one was buying them. Because well, everyone wants the crappy LCD TVs and also they're sort of kind of charging a bit much for, C uh, for CRT televisions there. So yeah, no surprise, uh, really. But yeah, what I'm trying to say is it was really a good idea I bought the TV as soon as possible because I know for sure I will never find another one like it. Uh, stupid bug. Uh, yeah, I will never find another TV like this in my entire lifetime, most definitely. Uh, finding CRT monitors is impossible in this country, considering that. So yeah, um, also it's well, it's quite worth it. Uh, Six thousand for an HD CRT, which is one of a kind here, in terms of availability, and it's much better than those cheap LCD panels that are just oversized thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight panels. So yeah, and uh, speaking of uh, paying too much for CRT, you want to know something that's a real ripoff? Well, that massive 58-inch uh, projection TV I, I ran into uh, in that surplus store where I showed a picture of it uh, earlier in this video. Um, that TV, guess how much a TV goes for? 5,000? 6,000? 8,000? 25 fucking thousand! That's like 430 US dollars or more. Which is more, more expensive than a P PS4 or a Nintendo Switch. That one is a real ripoff, and and you also have to consider it's a projection TV. Uh, it's a DLP type, uh, not that one of those CRT ones. Um, but the problem, even with a DLP type, is eventually the arc lamp that drives the projector inside the TV will eventually burn out. And that TV is from 2003, so you're never certain how much life there is left on the arc lamp of the TV. So once it's burned, well, good luck finding finding a replacement and have fun paying up to buy it because usually they go for stupid money for some reason uh, I'm not sure if the most of that co if, bulk, if the bulk of that cost actually came from uh, having that TV delivered from Korea all the way to the Philippines or it's actually uh, from buying a replacement arc lamp bulb for it uh, I don't know but yeah that's an even bigger of a ripoff and it's a projection TV the contrast is nowhere near as good as a as a CRT and it's also a bit soft so yeah it's basically like a DLP modern DLP projector but it's enclosed inside a shell uh, it's, a, it's, it's essentially a rear rear projection TV so yeah that one is a real ripoff because 25,000 for a projection TV from 2003 and then there's not mu and there's probably not much life left to that arc lamp that drives a projector yeah you gotta be kidding me of course I won't forget to mention that uh, computer monitors uh, that are CRT especially the high-end ones that are 19 to 21 inches in size sometimes even larger apparently um, those uh, CRT monitors can do resolutions much greater than than full HD in fact uh, my old Mitsubishi RDF 223H it's a Diamondtron uh, 21 inches. Um, that one can uh, uh, can handle 2048 by some uh, by by 1536 at 60 hertz. Progressive, by the way. So yeah, it's, it was a pretty sick monitor. I wish it was still working, but uh, sadly it broke down. Excuse me, uh, it broke down. So I had to replace it with uh, this Samsung SyncMaster 214TS before I bought an Asus Sync Mass, uh, Asus IPS panel which I'm now using which has some issues by the way but I don't think they're really worth mentioning 
Uh, basically, there's some noise that would appear on certain colors. Uh, so yeah, um, I still have the incentive to fix that monitor someday. And I'm even considering bringing it to work because I have a really nice uh, workshop area there that I uh, assembled uh, from a disused uh, room. Uh, it's also air conditioned, so yeah, it's a pretty nice workshop area I have there. Uh, so yeah, um, and um, I've been putting quite a bit of effort with the humor in this video. Uh, if you even call my humor humor, um, um, I was originally going to have a skit, a little skit uh, where I basically uh, watch some CT CCTV footage of some twat smashing up LCD TVs in an appliance store while I'm watching it on my HDCRT eating popcorn uh, to emphasize my dislike for LCDs taking over the world. Uh, I was originally going to implement it uh, in this video but uh, I decided not to because I realized oh those CCTV footages only have nothing but faceless figures which is completely uh, unacceptable in my production standards because I am weird. So yeah, uh, I think this Twatman skits already uh, funny enough and then also the self-insulting uh, bits here and there as well. Well, the reason why this video took so long to make is because well, I got very busy with work at various points in the past couple of months and finding an opportunity, finding opportunities to film the HDCRT in daylight uh, was quite difficult. Uh, I had to film it in daylight otherwise it will look like garbage uh, if I film it at night because if I film it at night all you'd see would just be the screen. You could barely see uh, the TV or its, or its surroundings um, unless uh, I set the exposure of the camera uh, but if I increase the uh, ex exposure I would end up with the screen of the TV looking like I'm supernova so it will look like crap and then I was, I'm only here around this house uh, during daytime and Sundays so um, unless it's holidays which were few and far between so yeah, fine. filming the TV was quite difficult, and then, and then I had the, and I also had to migrate editing to my new HP Z600 workstation, uh, very powerful workstation. I acquired it uh, a few months back. Uh, paid quite a lot for it, but it's definitely worth it. Um, I, think I only paid ten thousand for it uh, with dual Intel Xeon X5650, so it's quite awesome. And yeah, and. And my, um, my spells of uh, where I also had spells where I basically uh, lacked the motivation to work on videos uh, also hit me from time to time. Uh, probably a hiatus that's still lingering in me uh, because I was in a hiatus uh, around this time uh, last year, so uh, that might be a contributing factor to why this video took so long to make. Um, in the past several weeks, uh, pa not past several, pa past couple of weeks, I've been uh, pretty much uh, going full force on getting this video done as soon as possible. Uh, because mainly because I'm, uh, this is long overdue, and I'm growing sick and tired working on this project because it's it's been going on for so long. Uh, I've been considering making a secondary channel just for my live stream activities. Uh, consider because p people apparently don't like my live streaming on this channel uh, based on the number of dislikes I got when I accidentally left one of my Donkey Kong Country, Country 2 streams um, uh, open so yeah I, I wanna hear what you guys think about it about that would you rather I make a secondary channel for my live streaming activities or should I just do live streaming in this main channel as well uh, I would like to know uh, down in the comments. You can either make it civil or not, whatever your choice. And um, yeah, uh, uh, my stream, my live streaming should be way better now. My live, my last stream is an example of that. Thanks to this HPZ 600 workstation, having the horsepower to uh, encode H.264 and the interlace interlace video to uh, 60 frames per second uh, at 60 frames. And then I can also, and it also has the PCI slots that I that allow me to install my awesome BT878 capture cards. They're really good capture cards. Uh, uh, so my live streams would be top-notch quality from here on out, thanks to my Z600 workstation. So yeah, uh, let me know if you want me to make a secondary channel for live stream activities. I actually quite enjoy doing live streams, especially when the right people are bunched up in my server. I don't know, not server, uh, my stream. 
So, you may have noticed it by now, um, actually even before the start of this video because, well, it's on the thumbnail, I've got a uh, new lame load artwork. I'm calling it lame load now because, well, it sounds better than lame lol. It's supposedly French for axolotl, axolot, but uh, I ran it, uh, ran axolotl through the, uh, uh, Google Translate and it still said axolotl. So, yeah, but I, I still like uh, axolot. It's a it's a uh, uh, lame load. It sounds much better uh, and easier to say in my opinion. So, yeah, and I actually drew the character all by myself. Yeah, no shit. I actually sketched it. And then I cleaned it up with vectors by ha uh, with a tracking ball. And I just finished it uh, a few days before the completion of this video. Yeah, I, I always get a sense of prestige uh, have, uh, having done everything in my videos all by myself. Never depending on others whatsoever. Um, uh, though there are a few small exceptions in this video, uh, which I'll get into by the end of this video. Uh, at the very end, not this post uh, video ramble, but yeah, um, I would have loved. I would have. St I still would have liked using that uh, drawing made by Lumdrop uh, more often. But I, I would have been able to do that if it wasn't for my stupid hiatus from last year. And I feel like it's been long enough uh, that uh, it's time for me to uh, make my own assets. Uh, and uh, well, at least my my new drawing actually inherits some design elements from the uh, from Lumdrop's artwork. So at least it still lives on. And yeah, um, about the art thing. Yeah, I don't call myself. A, yeah, I'm actually. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I can actually draw, but I don't call. But the funny thing is, I don't call myself an artist. I deny myself uh, from being called an artist. Because I'm, I'm really not. I'm just some moron, a dickhead, a penis head who draws things somehow, who can somehow draw. So, yeah, because I'm nothing but a failure in that scene and turning my back uh, on it after uh, so much resent uh, has been one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. I will always remember d turning my back on that pointless thing uh, so fondly. Uh, even though the main cause of why I ended up th this way in the first place is actually all my own doing. Uh, but I wrote myself off as completely unfit for uh, participating in the art scene and I feel like I'm doing a, a service to them, uh, turning my back on the scene and then just quitting. Uh, there's no point for me to pursue this uh, fruitless endeavor, uh, to me at least. But while this is coming from someone who views himself as a failure, uh, what do you expect? Uh, so, yeah, and if I, I'm, I'm considering getting back to drawing, and uh, not art, drawing, just drawing, like drawing cabin, uh, cabinet. So, yeah, I'm gonna uh, do more of that. Uh, I'm gonna look into, I'm considering doing more of those, but I'm not gonna post any of my art on Deviant crap anymore. Uh, I, I'm not, I quit uh, participating in the art scene, uh, like I said, and instead I'll only post it on my website. Uh, which has the advantage of me of allow of that it it has the advantage where I can upload my picture my drawings in SVG format, so it'll be available in vector form, which is something that Deviant art Deviant crap still doesn't support. So I guess that makes my website far more superior because it can it can lo up I can upload vectors to it, whereas I can't do it on Deviant crap. So yeah, eh, art stinks. And I, I, I'm still fond of turning my back on that thing. Uh, no, there's nothing worthwhile about everything I made, anything I made in the art scene while I was still there. Nothing of it is of or, of value whatsoever. Bopiverse can go die, uh, at least for now. So yeah, um, I'm also planning on uh, adding my own motif in my videos, uh, make things a little bit more polished. Add a few uh, widgets and whatnot to improve uh, the presentation a little bit. Not by much, but it adds a little bit of polish. I like to keep uh, my videos a bit amateur still, amateur still, because I feel like it looks more genuine than uh, having like the same kind of motif that overblown motif that the big channels uh, ha have. As hinted earlier in the, near the beginning of this video. Uh, I've been accumulating a lot of cool shit from Japan and Korean surplus stores in the past uh, couple of months. 
uh, noteworthy items I, I managed to procure are a bunch of PS1 games and a couple of Nintendo 64 games. Uh, noteworthy titles are Metal Gear Solid, uh, Zelda Majora's Mask, Japanese versions of course because well these are Japan, Japan Store Plus. But well, what's the most important thing is I actually have the rights to own those games now. Uh, granted, this is a Japan version, but at least I have physical copy. It's quite nifty. I also found uh, soundtrack CDs of Final Fantasy VII and VIII. These are uh, this one is a I think four disc set. This one is four discs. I think this one is also four discs. I'm pretty sure these, I got both of these for like 50 pesos each. And I'm pretty sure these go for stupid money on eBay because Final Fantasy. And I haven't actually really got into the Final Fantasy series all that much, but I quite like uh, Nobuo Oematsu's uh, music. So um, I'm, and I'm considering getting into that series at some point in the future. Um, what other things? Oh yeah, I found I've also found uh, uh, two Nintendo 64 controllers. I found more but I only got two so far uh, N64 controllers uh, that are free of erectile dysfunction and I also found one with a control uh, one of them came with a controller pack which was nice because it finally uh, allowed me to play through Turok because I, which I never managed to beat during my childhood because I did not have a controller pack to save my progress so yeah and I also found uh, another PS1 uh, that can, comes with two memory cards of PS1 multi-tap, which I've been wanting for so long a time. And I also found a family computer. I've not had a family computer that works in so long as well. A couple of games, uh, one of them, a couple of them are classics, and a ver one very late one, uh, Kirby's Adventure. And yeah, so much crap. And then I got all of these for cheap. The games are usually 50 pesos or less. And the console, the family computer, the Nintendo 64, I think were just 200 pesos each. Uh, 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 yeah, they were 200 pesos. Uh, yeah, I got the second N64, and just in case my old one from my youth eventually dies out. Uh, but the new N64 also comes with a memory expansion pack, so I can play Majora's Mask. Yeah, so much crap uh, brought from, bought from uh, surplus, Japan Korean surplus stores for real cheap. And the absolute best find I've, I've uh, had so far is, well, you've already seen this earlier, is this thing. It's a Sony Digital Handicam DCR VX1000. Uh, if you don't know what this thing is, well, it's a, one of the fir uh, first prosumer cameras Sony, Sony fired out for the, uh, to the consumer. Well, obviously, this thing was quite expensive and was quite new. But this one was was fairly high end. It's it's actually quite capable for a uh, video camera. It's got a really nice shotgun mic. It's got a rotary uh, encoder for manual focus. It's also got a nice uh, analog uh, zoom rocker. Uh, really nice precision on this. You can do really smooth, soft, uh, slow zoom in and zoom out with this very easily. Whereas at VX1, uh, no, LX7, I'm using right now uh, to film this uh, rambling. It, it doesn't, you cannot adjust the focus on that thing while it's recording and it's um, which is annoying because it prevents me from from doing like that silly depth of field transition effect and the microphones on it are not exactly great and then the zoom the, uh, zoom rocker on it is very imprecise I think it only has like like three or four uh, uh, le speed levels it's very hard to do zo slow and smooth gradual zoom in and zoom out whereas it's easy super easy to do it here on the LX7 not so much because while the LX7 is more mostly a point and shoot camera it's not really a video camera um, so it has these annoying limits where it can only record uh, videos in 30 minute uh, intervals it cannot record uh, more than that and then all this one can conti uh, can record continuously as long as there's tape or if you add this wired up to a uh, one of those uh, DV rec uh, external DV recorder devices that record to to compact flash cards or a, or a laptop hard drive like a Firestore DV or a data eater of videos uh, DM60 and yeah this and yeah I'm actually considering replacing this damn thing uh, that this damn LX7 with this thing because well, because this thing is 60 frames per second. That 
Lumix LA7 is 50 frames per second and I'm already getting, I've been getting sick and tired of dealing with 50 frames per second. I want to go 60 but this camera can only do 50 because this is a PAL system camera that somehow ended up in this NTSC country and my parents bought that from F7 appliances so who knows um, and it's real annoying I tried bringing that camera to uh, service mode still records only at 50 frames which is annoying and then so yeah I'll be losing I'll be sacrificing full HD in favor of this thing for just for the 60 frames per second um, yeah this is standard definition only thing and it uses DV tapes uh, no problem I don't mind using DV tapes uh, because I've been using this for quite a bit uh, especially for work and I'm quite well stocked with DV tapes uh, I've got a bunch of 80 minute tapes for real cheap uh, 10 pesos a pop for uh, no, 10 pesos for a pack of two which was great at the uh, Gaisano mall uh, it was also a good, a good thing I got them sooner because well sadly the Gaisano mall burned down uh, uh, I think two weeks ago from as of the filming of this uh, video uh, which sucks because that, that mall had a pretty big place in my childhood uh, and even though despite the expansions that it had received uh, uh, recently um, if you go deep enough into the mall there are still many sections there that look pretty much exactly the same as it was when, it, when I was still a little kid so yeah it sucks that it's gone now uh, hopefully the mall will come back soon uh, guys I know is a pretty big franchise there a bunch of uh, bunch of those malls dotted around the Philippines uh, yeah I guess that's life I suppose so yeah um, in my next video uh, upcoming videos I'm gonna uh, uh, switch over to this VX1000 my videos will be 4x3 uh, well this one can record in widescreen anamorphically what it actually does is it just takes a rectangular section of a 4x3 frame and then just stretches it to make it look like anamorphic widescreen the problem with that is the CCD sensors of this thing are only 480i and you get like weird uh, you effectively lose resolution if you use anamorphic widescreen mode so yeah 4x3 all the way but it'll still be 1080p just for those 60 frames per second I would still use the LX7 from time to time uh, just to take pictures of uh, subjects that I'm doing a video of so you get glimpses of what it will look like in full HD so yeah, it won't, it won't be completely standard def all the way and yeah I would also look a bit soft using this camera but uh, don't most people on the internet uh, want people to be blurry figures to begin with so yeah um, I would like to mention that uh, oh yeah I forgot to mention about the D, uh, DCR VX1000 this, this camera goes for stupid money on eBay uh, this camera was quite popular amongst uh, skater twats, uh, cheap porn, and also uh, jackass wannabes. So, uh, yeah, these are sought after in, uh, for some reason, even though these things are standard def only. And they go for absolutely ridiculous amounts on eBay, uh, just for this camera alone. Uh, what's so special about this find is this one is actually new in box. I actually still have the original box for this damn thing and pretty much all of its original accessories like like the uh, bigger iCop uh, charge battery charger that also doubles as a power brake uh, battery uh, yeah a battery which actually still works by the way which is quite shocking because I'm so used to seeing surplus equipment with the dead batteries so it's quite a surprise that the battery of this thing is still working but it's good because I can use this anywhere um, so yeah, and I, how much did I pay for this thing? Just uh, 45 US dollars. No joke. And you probably, I imagine some people get mad by, oh, this is brand new, new in box. Ah, you gotta either sell that on eBay for ridiculous amounts or put it on a shelf like a collector's crap hoarder item. No, I'm actually gonna use this thing. I use my shit, sorry. Um, so yeah, um, so yeah, this thing actually still works. I actually used it for work uh, a few times uh, because while well, this can take video much better than a DSLR at work, yeah, it's standard def only. But this one had is, is just more capable at video than the DSLR, and also some other guys using the DSLR for taking pictures anyway. So I just so that guy is going around taking pictures while I'm here with the VX1000. Uh, using the camera to film the whole uh, film events and whatnot. So yeah, uh, really nice VX1000. The only problem that this thing has 
is there's actually some funky fungus in the lens barrel which is very unfortunate and I don't think I can fix it because I don't know if the lens barrel can even be taken apart for cleaning and there are no shops here in this uh, country that can uh, uh, demold uh, lens barrels of in vir virtually any uh, camera, video, uh, photo, anything with optics basically. There are no places that I can have this service that and the tape controls on the camera itself are not functioning because the ribbon cable here had broken off um, because well as well, this is a common problem with the VX1000 because while well, it was placed poorly on the door door for the uh, tape uh, mechanism so yeah it shouldn't be too difficult to fix because there's only like five or six traces on the ribbon cable and it could very well easily be replaced with AWG 30 wire uh, which I heard is one of the repair methods of the tape controls here. Uh, at the moment, I don't mind uh, not being able to control the uh, uh, the camera with these. I can always use the remote that comes with. Yeah, there's also another thing that this ca this camera has that the LX7 doesn't have. It has a remote, so doing shots like these would be much easier because I would just do it like that, and then it, the camera now records. And then also another useful thing that this camera has is there's a light on the front that illuminates when it's recording. So I know for sure if the camera is still recording or not. Uh, whereas the the Mix Alex Seven has no indication of uh, whether or not it's still recording or not. Um, and it the, it makes beeps when it stops, but uh, you cannot always hear the, those beeps when you're busy mumbling about. So yeah, VX One Thousand. I'm gonna replace this replace the Alex Seven with this thing because this thing is much nicer. Sixty frames per second, and being able to adjust focus and whatnot. Uh, I would like to mention that before I move on that when I was a little kid I really wanted to play Super Mario Sunshine but I was never able to because Fall Stores here did not have any GameCubes and then I had this silly idea where I would invent some kind of weird accessory for the N64 that would allow you to play GameCube games somehow not knowing that the, N the GameCube is a way more powerful system and is completely different architecture than the N64 uh, though my idea of a CD-based add-on uh, for the N64 is actually not too far off uh, because there's a Game Doctor V64 uh, not too far off from reality so I was a little kid at the time, uh, a little twat and yeah I, I never knew about the Game Doctor V64 so I had silly ideas like that but, the, uh, but at least it's not too far off from reality uh, the CD-ROM thing uh, also, um, what I've been mostly using the VX1000 for is transferring uh, surviving family tapes uh, that were filmed using DV. Uh, old tapes when I was still a little twat uh, that still survived. Um, yeah, I actually use that thing. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a collector hoarder. I actually use my shit, sorry. Uh, so yeah. I do have plans to obtain a much better video camera in the future. Uh, I've been eyeing on getting a JVC GY HM70U, uh, which is a pretty high-end uh, professional video camera. Uh, I'm getting video camera. I'm not gonna go buy another point-and-shoot and, -shoot and uh, or a DSLR. Uh, those will just be a waste of money, and they have limitations. Because well, they're frankly meant for still photography. They're uh, photography, not really for video. A video camera is for video. A, a uh, camera is for still pictures. So yeah, I'm not like I'm not following the steps of those uh, mainstream channels that just use a DSLR, or, and yeah, um, I know they. I'm pretty sure they always usually have a limitation that uh, a proper video camera would not have. Um, and also the reason why I'm switching over to VX1000 is it's quite literally the only video camera I have that can film at 60 frames per second. So yeah, I would really get on get a GY HM70U at some point in the future and I still have to save up because well they still quite uh, cost quite a bit uh, it would cost just almost about the same as a brand new point and, point and shoot that can do 60 but the GY HM70U is most likely going to be better built has more features in, uh, that are oriented for videos uh, so yeah um, so that event so maybe someday in the future, uh, Lingai 64 will go back to full HD once I have a better camera for the job. I'll, be ma I'll mention a few updates uh, regarding my project PS Noob Debugger and PS Noob SDK. I'm gonna do it quick because this uh, post video rambling is uh, quite long and I'm getting I'm running out of time. 
So yeah, uh, PS Nova SDK, uh, um, ever since the release of the video of it, uh, I've managed to get C++ working thanks to iJax on GitHub giving me pointers on what to do to get C++ working. Uh, uh, only just uh, basic C++, no standard C++ library support, which is good enough to me. The official SDK didn't have full standard C++ support anyway, uh, and I think having uh, standard C++ would make my SDK very bloat. It would probably result to uh, PS EXEs that are too big to load to the PS1's memory. So yeah, just uh, stick a uh, just uh, classes are good enough for me, uh, really. And uh, speaking of which, uh, I should also mention that uh, it has uh, I've written a much better intro handler on it. Uh, very uh, much better uh, handler. You can. It's now super easy to hook your own uh, interrupts. Uh, uh, interrupt callbacks now you just simply hook them to the appropriate interrupt interrupt no number it works on all 10 uh, all 11 uh, available interrupt uh, uh, channels so yeah and in fact thanks to the new interrupt handler I managed to get serial uh, full serial support implemented in my SDK uh, that allowed me to port light load from the official SDK all the way to PS Noob SDK which actually made the loader much smaller um, and also, yeah, uh, uh, speaking of which, my PS Noob SDK project has actually become so powerful that it effectively replaced PsyQ or the Programmer's Tool SDK for me, uh, essentially. I've been using it for prototyping. Yeah, when you know, when uh, PS1 aficionado finds his own SDK uh, to be uh, go uh, good enough to replace my official SDK, and uh, uh, not my official, the official SDK. Uh, you know something is up or something along those lines. So yeah, um, there's still plenty of work to be done with PS Noob SDK. I still have to write CD-ROM libraries for it. The SPU libraries still need quite a lot of work. In fact, uh, there's actually a bug in that SDK that prevents you from activate uh, uh, channels over 16. So you can only activate the first 16 channels. You can access activate the 20 the remaining ones so I have to get that fixed too but priority will be in the CD-ROM library this month as uh, because I, I as I plan to uh, get CD-ROM stuff working uh, implemented this uh, month um, in fact uh, earlier um, I managed to get uh, thanks to the new intro handler uh, dealing with the CD-ROM controller is so much easier now um, that I managed to instruct the CD-ROM controller to spin the CD backwards and I also managed to uh, figure out how to make it play a CD audio track. I still haven't gotten the da uh, data sector reads yet, uh, but it shouldn't be too difficult to implement now that I'm very familiar with how it works now. So yeah, PS Noob SDK is getting better and better. Also, I've written new examples. Uh, one is a first-person shooter, uh, a first-person perspective example with a look at, and another one that demonstrates render to texture that will be released in the uh, upcoming update, but you can always find a copy of. You can always uh, see it for yourself uh, sooner if you check the get my self-hosted GitHub page. So yeah, uh, PS Noob SDK is just getting better and better. It's pretty much miles ahead of the official uh, of the all other open source SDK projects that I'm aware of. that are most likely no longer up to date. Uh, while you won't be seeing much news on PS Noob SDK, I would still update on it from time to time. Um, I'm only going to do a video of it uh, again once I've uh, implemented a substantial am amount of updates to the SDK. They'll make it worth, uh, make, they'll make it worth uh, doing a video of uh, instead of doing a bunch of small videos showcasing t uh, uh, every new tiny feature that's been added. Um, so I'd rather just compile it into one big video. Uh, it'll be far more entertaining and it'll keep my channel clean. So yeah, um, as for PS Noob Debugger, I've uh, improved the interface a little bit. I've uh, rewrote the debug kernel to RMIPS, RMIPS making it 100% open source. And uh, it now requires light load 1.3 because it has a uh, kernel uh, patch hook, up a, new, a new activation logic basically. Uh, light load one point. I should. I forgot to mention. Light load one point two and onwards is now free and open source. It's made with PS Noob SDK, and 
what else? I've also, I've also implemented a better uh, communications protocol for uh, PC to debug kernel uh, exchanges. I've also implemented data access breakpoints, only a single access data access breakpoint. I haven't figured out if it's even possible to do multiple data access breakpoints entirely in software with just the COP0 debug registers. I'm not very sure if the DTLH2000 actually has additional hardware that allows for transparent uh, mat, uh, comparing compares of uh, uh, DRAM accesses. I'm not sure, but it's possible. And I still have to test it out. Same for uh, multiple data, uh, not data, program breakpoints as well, uh, which I have yet to implement soon. Um, so yeah, PSF debugger is still being worked on from time to time. Not as free, not as uh, frequent as PS2 SDK, but it's been polished. But it's being polished uh, uh, slowly uh, from time to time. Uh, I've been planning on implementing Coms Link support to it, uh, as I've been working on a Coms Link adapter as of late. Uh, it's a parallel port-based one that's derived from the Coms Link USB adapter that I've modified for parallel port, which is probably the dumbest thing you've ever heard because you would say, "Who the hell uses parallel port?" Well, me. And I don't have any Arduinos that are that work like a Leonardo, where you could make it behave like an original USB device. So yeah, parallel port it is for now. And also many of my computers, including HPC Z600, will have PCIe parallel port card. That's based on a CH384. Uh, should still work on Comslink because they have uh, bi-directional still, which is what you need. Now, the reason why I chose Comslink is because it offers bi-directional 8-bit data out, data in, 8-bit data in. Because the Explorer FX is only 8 data out and then five, uh, 4 uh, line, status lines in. It's basically SPP or Centronics mode. It's very slow, especially when, I, when you have to do like bit banging just to send a whole 8-bit value from the PS1 side to PC. So it'll be much slower because of the uh, bit banging required when transmitting from PS1 to PC which is not good for a debugger because you're gonna be loading chunks of memory from the console and you need a fast data bus for it to perform well uh, and I don't think Explorer FX can keep up uh, with my dem uh, requirements so it comes like it is. My circuit still needs a bit of work it's not working the way I want it uh, at the moment um, I'm most definitely gonna release the designs once I got it working right um, I'll be calling it the Wank Link uh, adapter or just the Lame Link adapter. Um, if in, ca uh, in case you're wondering, uh, what about Comslink USB? Well, that's completely useless for our projects because there's no source code provided on how to use it. So it's useless uh, because the others of it are stupid. Uh, what do you expect? So I'm gonna I'm I'm considering making my own uh, U USB adapter uh, for Comslink as well. It'll be once I get uh, better dev boards that are basically miniaturized Leonardo, uh, Leonardo's like a teensy. So, yeah, um, I like to delve into these electronic projects. I like to uh, see if I can. I like to try out uh, more complicated circuits that involve digital logic. So yeah, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for all there is to say about PS2 debugger Comslink stuff. Needs work. I plan to make a USB adapter for it for those who are, uh, for some reason, cannot get a computer with a parallel port. So, yeah. Hmm. I'll just go check my list here, make sure that I have everything. I shift things a little bit. I had the DP, PS2 debugger, the last one. Um, oh, yeah, the family computer, I think. Uh, yeah, I got a family computer uh, already. So, yeah, I think I pretty much uh, all of it now so oh oh yeah this is this is another one of those uh, uh, this is another uh, one of the awesome Japanese surplus fi finds I got um, it's a Toshiba Libretto FF1100V and as you can see it's running off batteries there's no stupid tether hanging off of it just to keep the laptop running it's actually running off batteries and I actually had the balls to rebuild the battery pack of this thing just to get it running on battery because what the hell is the point of a laptop when you cannot use it anywhere because the battery pack is dead and I will do whatever it takes to repair the battery pack of a lap old laptop if I, if I feel like wanting to be able to use it anywhere I go so I could like um, use this in Starbucks uh, whatnot oh wait I actually did that already 
So yeah, I actually cracked open the battery pack and replaced it with Goop 18650 cells. These are cheap 18650s, but at least they're not ultra fires. And they also come with pre-welded tabs, so they're a piece of cake to solder together. And they seem to last really uh, quite, uh, they seem to have really good battery life. This, it, they, these, this, these can keep the laptop running for uh, 2 hours 30 minutes. So yeah, the nifty little laptop. It's way more fun I had with my old than my old PC98 laptop that I actually used in college for a while. No joke. Uh, mainly because I could actually run the DOS games I love. I like playing on that thing, but I can't on the PC98. And the only games I actually played on my PC98 uh, was just Toho, and that's it. And I was also originally gonna do the same thing with my ThinkPad X40's battery pack, where I would, where I actually tried to rebuild it. In fact, you can even see that. The failed rebuild I did. The uh, reason why I call it failed is because I made the mis uh, mistake of losing battery, uh, losing power to the battery management board. No, no, bang! You ruined everything. Hey, and now what? The laptop refuses to charge it. Uh, stupid me! I should have just hold off the pro. Uh, you know, I should have just stopped at some point and resumed later after finishing the uh, chores. But I, for e but idiot me decided to try to push on, and I ended up getting pressured, and then I, I lost the concentration, and then I ended up uh, losing power to the battery management board, and I even shorted the last cell br for a brief moment. So yeah, battery management board is fucked, and. The laptop refuses to charge it, which is sucks. Uh, I managed to coerce it to get the laptop running on battery again. Um, but we can, usually, the laptop would even refuse to run. It would just immediately power off when you try to turn it on with a bat with a uh, Frankenstein of a failed battery pack. Uh, but I, I managed to coerce it with a charger, but well, having to coerce it just to get it running on that bastardized battery pack, um, and then the bat laptop still refuses to charge it. Uh, I still write it off as a failure, which sucks. I paid quite a lot for those cells. They were cheap, 210, but if you multiply them, them 4 by 4 they become a bit expensive. So I'm probably just going to repurpose this cell, these cells for other projects. And I'm probably going to have to buy another uh, ThinkPad X40 battery pack. And if it still has some life on it, I would use that pack for a while. Once that finally goes out, I'll rebuild it the same way as this cell. Hopefully in... Uh, Hopefully it'll be successful. I will not make that stupid mistake of losing power to the battery management. Ah, ah, well, what do you expect, stupid me? And I'm used to calling myself stupid uh, by this point. Uh, don't bother intervening. I don't even know if it's if it'll be even be successful if I did not uh, do that. Do that uh, if I did not lose power to the battery management board. Uh, because you know these these new mo these modern battery management uh, controllers are smart asses. Uh, sometimes sometimes they're sometimes you never know if they're clever enough to commit suicide if they suddenly detect an increase in a sudden increase in voltage and then they would brick themselves. But it seem but it's said to be it's said that most of them can be rebuilt you know by replacing the cells in parallel with the old one. They say to basically prevent losing power to the battery management board otherwise they it will commit seppoku if it if it uh, lost power like what happened with a battery pack on my x40 so yeah i'm not i'm not a pansy when it comes to rebuilding laptop batteries because i have bollocks to do it and i don't want to look like an idiot having to tether a laptop to a wall outlet every, uh, every single time i need to use my laptop and i've been i've already been through that in college where i was dealing with a laptop with a non with no battery pack whatsoever and I'm sick and tired of having to look for us for an electrical outlet just to use my laptop and then losing my work because a brownout happened. Or some idiot uh, twat uh, topple, uh, tripped over my uh, power cord. So yeah, um, such a shame really. Oh, I almost forgot to mention that I'm most definitely going to do a video on uh, the Toshiba Libretto uh, in the near future. Uh, I'll try to I'll be doing another type of video uh, first before the libretto so uh, just stay tuned I suppose so yeah I guess that's pretty much uh, it for this uh, post video ramble uh, man there's quite a lot to say really so that's why it's quite long so yeah uh, 800 subscribers uh, thanks uh, though I won't be surprised if it goes down to below 800 when uh, because this video is not PS1 related, and I'm pretty, and I feel like, 
feel that most of those subs are actually in in for a PS1 content and then when they see something that's not PS1 content a good chunk of them would usually drop out because what you expect people I guess anyway um, I need to get to uh, sleep uh, shortly it's quite late uh, as of the filming of this video uh, also um, I'd like to thank uh, High Treason for uh, letting me use a, a very short clip from his uh, reliable K6 video uh, about the sounds really shitty thing and also taking a short clip of, it, of uh, his uh, Jeffen uh, scalar box uh, because I don't know I could have just searched a, a picture from you, uh, the internet but I don't know I just thought it would be a bit better to do a video clip uh, if I even uh, uh, if we managed to make a take a video clip of it uh, but anyway I hope you enjoyed watching this video and uh, uh, yeah I don't know my mind's a bit loose now because I'm getting sleepy so yeah I hope you enjoyed watching this video and thanks for watching uh, Lingbag64 is signing out and have a good day